Thursday, August 1st, 2019, meeting of the Planning Board. Uh, first order of business is to review and approve minutes. Uh, we do not have any minutes that were published in time for us to review, so we'll get to that next month. Uh, we do have some bills. Right. Um, I have a bill for Graves Engineering, technical review fee for 180-222 Hartford Turnpike for $757.50. A bill from WB Mason nameplate for Timothy Jerry for nine dollars and ninety-two cents. Do I have a motion? Move to accept. I've got a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Board member comments. Uh, Mr. Gordon, any comments this month? I have none, thank you. Mr. Jerry. No comment. Mr. No comments this month, Mr. Chairman. None, sir. I have no comments myself. Our first hearing is a new public meeting for a garage and repair shop administrative site plan review for location 384 Hartford Turnpike. So uh, you would have received um, supplemental in fact, uh, information about this administrative site plan review. Um, it is under the threshold for a uh, typical site plan approval. So this is administrative site plan uh, review. So we're here to take, uh, I'm going to take your recommendations or comments tonight if you have any. Um, I did put a draft letter in front of you, which is typically how we've done these, um, where I just write what happened at the board meeting tonight regarding it. In this case, it was a rather large site. Um, despite being under the threshold for, um, as I just mentioned, site plan approval. So we did ask the applicant to um, pay for and submit um, to a peer review by Graves Engineering for drainage on the site. Uh, Graves Engineering did offer some um, point of concern, not point of concerns, but some points of concern um, regarding the site. And the letter basically says, at least at this time, unless there's additional recommendations, I can amend the letter that the, um, the recommendation of the board would be that the applicant um, address these issues in Graves' letter. So um, I'll hear if there are any recommendations, we can vote on them. If not, we can vote on the recommendations as written, and I will just sign and submit that to the building inspector um, on tomorrow, so on Monday. Very good. Does anybody have any questions? or Move to submit it to the building inspector. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Two signatures, right? Nope. Our uh, next hearing is a continuance for three, I'm sorry, this is a continuance for 360 Hartford Turnpike, and I believe they've asked for additional continuance. Uh, yes, they asked for a continuance to um, our September 5th meeting. Um, that's, that's it, really. I have the continuance here, but I didn't print it out for you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any concerns for continuing this meeting? Okay. okay. I move that we grant the continuance as requested by the applicant. I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, moving right along. Our next. Uh, Hearing is a continued public hearing. Mr. Walter Lakers will recuse himself, and Mr. Colonel Rao will sit in. This is a continued public hearing for the Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond Market Basket Project, site plan and special permit. Um, as a reminder to the listening audience and those that are present here today, um, we are looking at three specific items that we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to talk about the response to the Graves letter from the applicant the planner's comments, and we can address some landscaping issues um, if there are any. Right. So at this time, Mr. Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mark Donahue from Fletcher Tilton on behalf of the owner and applicant with me is Roy Smith of R.J. O'Connell, the uh, design uh, civil engineers. Uh, also uh, to make the presentation to you this evening is Jonathan Rouse, who is up at the uh, laptop. And Steve Dedarian of VHB is the landscape architect who will be making a presentation with regard to that. Uh, we have had the chance since the last meeting to receive uh, the July 23rd, 2019 review letter prepared by Graves Engineering. 
Uh, and we have also had the opportunity to meet with Jeff Walsh of Graves Engineering, Mr. Cahill and Mr. Truman to review those and understand better what those were, which led to the drafting of a response letter that um, we apologize but just got to you today. Um, and so uh, it's up to you, Mr. Chairman. We're glad to go through each point or simply point out those matters which uh, were of a more material matter uh, and how we have resolved them uh, as far as the uh, comments. Some refer to, um, you know, making uh, additions to plans and the like rather rote in some fashion. So uh, I, I would suggest that we leave the administrative pieces out right. of the response to uh, help with the time. Right. So one of the first issues, Roy, you want to walk through it? Or yeah, do you want sure. me to take I it? I can walk through it. Okay. Uh, just quickly, if uh, you want to just go to the next slide, Jonathan, if you could. So uh, one of his first comments is uh, zoning-related uh, special permit. Uh, we add spot grades at all of our handicapped parking spaces to make sure they're ADA compliant, less than 2% cross slope and less than 5% in the direction of travel. Uh, we missed a set of handicap spaces. Uh, we will add those spot grades to those appropriate handicap spaces as part of that. Uh, another zoning issue or compliance issue that Steve Dairy and the landscape architect will talk about that Graves brought up is the landscaping along the frontage and he'll go into that in more detail during his presentation. Uh, we've also prepared a vehicle maneuvering plan. Uh, <clears throat> both emergency vehicles and service vehicles uh, will be sitting down with the fire department uh, separately to review that emergency vehicle turning movement plan uh, and we'll be submitting that with the package uh, to this board as well. Uh, it's pretty pretty simple. Uh, the from a just from a service and emergency vehicle. The fire station is obviously east along Route 20. They come down Route 20. They can take a left into the site at the easterly entrance drive, uh, or they could continue down and take a left into the site at the signalized intersection. They could travel through uh, the commercial roadway portion and then go up into the residential ring road, for lack of a better term, uh, and come back down, and they can loop through and around all the commercial buildings to get 360-degree access. There was a question from the fire department uh, on a separate matter about getting 360-degree access to the residential buildings. Uh, that's what we'll address when we meet with the fire department directly. Uh, as part of that plan, we also spot locate hydrant locations, so we'll be reviewing that with the fire department as well, uh, just from a safety and, and pedestrian and fire service aspect of it. Uh, from a from a stormwater management perspective, the comments were relatively minor. Uh, I'll take a step back, and uh, we have seven on-site conventional detention basins, and I'll kind of go through where their locations. This is Basin 1, Basin 2, Basin 3, Basin 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, the, the reason why we have so many basins is the stormwater management policy requires us to control not only peak flows, but water quality aspects as well. Uh, all the basins are designed very similar to one another. They're all infiltration basins, and they all hold what they refer to as the one-inch water quality volume. That means if one inches of rain or less falls onto the site, it gets captured in either one of these seven basins and gets infiltrated into the ground. There is absolutely no discharge from the site with a one inch storm in below. A one inch storm is, is what they, the reason why they call that the water quality volume is they refer to the one inch storm as the first flush. The majority of pollutants go in the first flush and hence the reason why they, they the regulations, the mass stormwater policy, and the local bylaw require us to capture and retain the one inch storm event. We've analyzed three different storm events, the t two, 10, and 100 year storm events uh, for both peak flow and water quality aspects. From a peak flow perspective, in the existing analysis points are obviously the bank of the Flint Pond and or the wetlands. Uh, so all the drainage under the existing conditions, if you want to take us <coughs> to the slide previous to that, Jonathan, I'd appreciate it. 
So under existing conditions, uh, I think I went over this quickly at the last meeting, but I'll review it again. This is the existing, the former drive-in facility. Uh, it's broken up asphalt, so forth and so on. It has one entrance drive and egress drive, uh, and it slopes this way towards where the old screen used to be uh, and discharges to a wetland system and then, then out to Flint Pond. So that's an analysis point. Then there's a, a, a knoll right in about this location, which is about 25, 30 feet higher than the drive-in site. Uh, and that slopes to the east, I mean to the west, to the east, to the south, and to the north. Uh, and then this gradually slopes up. This is what they refer to as Orchard Meadows. It's the condominium complex senior housing, uh, or age-restricted housing, I should say. And then there's some single-family homes in this location uh, along our easterly property line. This, is, this property line is essentially the town line with Grafton as well. That's our southerly property line. Uh, as you can see, there's an existing development going on here as well. Some of it's already built and open and operational, and they're, they're building a, a phase here as well. Uh, on the west side of our property, there's a 250-foot electric easement. There's really no sensitive receptors to our east side. Uh, on our north side, across Route 20, uh, are some industrial and commercial developments. Uh, and if you go up Lake Street, this is the Lake Street and Route 20 intersection. If you go up Lake Street, there's the aggregate asphalt plant uh, and then some commercial businesses here as well. Uh, that kind of gives you the lay of the land. So our sensitive receptors are really on our south easterly property line and our easterly property line. Uh, it's, it, you can't, it's hard to read in this slide, but uh, the closest Orchard Meadows building to our property line is already 90 feet. Uh, and Steve will get into this about some landscape buffers and the discussion of when he gets into the landscaping uh, and how we're, we're keeping existing vegetation and so forth and so on. The single family house uh, is in this location, that's about 120 feet east of our property line. Uh, so uh, that will come into play in, in future part of my discussion. Uh, but getting back to stormwater management, that's the existing conditions and it all flows directly and eventually gets to Flint Pond. So if you could go back to the slide, the grading and drainage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the, the, the drainage system is a closed drainage system, catch basins, drain manholes and pipes, and it gets transferred through that closed drainage system, through a water quality unit, and then eventually into the detention basin uh, or infiltration basin in this, in this instance. Uh, the, what they refer to as water quality improvements, back when I was a young engineer, we only had to control peak flow. Uh, so you analyze the existing conditions and the ground cover and the soil and all that stuff, and you come up with a flow that is actually going to the bank of Flint Pond under existing conditions for the three different storm events, the two, 10, and 100-year storm event. Uh, and then you do the same thing under your proposed conditions. And that peak flow has to be, under your proposed conditions, has to be under or equal to the existing peak flows. Uh, so there's the peak flow aspect. But now the new storm, the mat, well, it's not new, but it's been around for like 20 years now, uh, the Massachusetts stormwater policy and the local bylaw, the stormwater bylaw, requires us to not only treat peak flow and handle peak flows, but water quality aspects as well, prior to discharge to any water body or wetlands system. Uh, they refer to the water quality in, as total suspended solids removal. And the requirement is 80% total suspended solids removal. Uh, as Graves' peer review letter states, uh, we have met both the peak flows and the water quality aspects of the total suspended solids removal. The 80% we exceed in the peak flows under proposed conditions, we're under existing in all cases. Uh, I think that's a brief summary of the stormwater management. Uh, he did have one comment that we're going to have to rerun some analysis and we've already run, rerun the calcs. These wooded areas here, we had them as fair condition. Uh, he, one of his comments were that they should be modeled as good condition. 
So we've already rerun that model and checked it against our peak flows and our water quality, and we're still meeting that. So uh, as part of our resubmission package to Graves in, in this board, um, you'll, you'll see that revised analysis changing it, the woods from fair to good uh, as part of that. Uh, some of his other comments were, uh, if you can go to the parking traffic control plan, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, is we have to show and label all loading areas and dumpsters and so forth and so on. Uh, what we've done since uh, the original submission, it's kind of tough to see here, but uh, each residential building group, we have one uh, enclosed dumpster location. So for these three groups of residential buildings and the clubhouse and leasing building, we have a, a dumpster location which is gonna be enclosed, fenced in and closed with access gates. For these three buildings, we're putting one here, right there. Sorry, my mouse keeps jumping around. Uh, for these group of three residential buildings, we're adding a dumpster location here. From a residential perspective, we also have a little maintenance uh, garage area here for you know uh, tools, shovels, sand, salt, so forth and so on, that, that will service the residential aspect of the project. From the commercial pers perspective, this is the market basket and the associated re abutting retail. This is the pharmacy or potential pharmacy. Uh, we don't have tenants uh, as what was discussed at this time other than the market basket. This is potentially a bank out parcel with dr some dry foods. Uh, the loading area for the market basket and the freestanding retail, uh, the abutting retail, is all located in the back of the, of the supermarket. Uh, and that's, that's kind of key because we want to screen it from the road, not only from the road, but from our sensitive receptors along our easterly property line. Uh, this, the, this pharmacy is about 350 feet away from our easterly property line. Uh, so our closest commercial building is 350 feet plus whatever they have to their house on their own property, uh, which I discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, the wetlands are shown here, and these are little flag locations. The wetlands are have already been approved through the wetlands, the, through the Conservation Commission, through an RDA, what they refer to as an RDA, and we received that uh, positive determination. It's bordering vegetated wetlands, uh, and it's a 100-foot buffer zone. We have filed with the Conservation Commission we have yet to open up our first hearing with them uh, due, some, due to some quorum issues, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, I think we're on the agenda for this month. Correct. I do believe. Uh, so we'll make a decision whether we're gonna continue that one or at least do a presentation at that, that this month's hearing in front of the Conservation Commission. Do you mind if I interrupt you for yeah, one no moment? <coughs> on, the, on the dumpsters, yep. what's, what's the capacity for each of the dumpsters to serve? I think they're buildings? about 15. Yachts, 10 to 15 yachts okay. each. And that seems like an, a small amount considering the number of units that are there. So what will the um, transfer or the emptying of that? It, they'll be hired through a private contractor, obviously. Uh, I don't know the timing of transfers and that's up to the property managers uh, okay. of, the, of the residential property. Uh, I don't know if they do it weekly or, you know, when, when needed type of thing, but I, I kind of leave that up to the property managers. Okay. Uh, we, <coughs> we can find out an anticipated, given the volume of use and give you an estimate as to how many times a week. It'll yeah, be and if they, they need to, uh, we could put in a larger dumpster, you know, obviously if they're coming every day, they're gonna make, make us put in the larger dumpster. They're gonna say, we can't come and empty this thing every day or every two days or whatever right. it is, you know, it's just not practical. Uh, so. Uh, the, that's uh, kind of the dumpsters and loading area. That was one of his comments. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Are there going to be compactors at the residential sites or just no, the... No, just dumpsters, I think. Just at the this point. Market Basket will have a compactor, I assume, or... Market Basket has two compactors, actually. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're, one is here mm -hmm. and one is here. Okay. And this is their loading area for the Market Basket. It's double-ended, so the, the, the service vehicles coming in here to go into this loading area can either take a left through here and come down and in, and 
and then leave, or they can come down here and, and come in. And hey, may leave. I ask a question? Is there only one? Uh, excuse me, sir. We're not opening for public comment yet, so please hold your question. <coughs> so from a service vehicle perspective, they could also come down here and come down this ring road and come into this dumpster, I mean this loading dock area or this lo lo loading dock area for the uh, uh, budding retail development and leave the site here. Uh, this is supposedly a, a pharmacy tenant. Uh, as you are, if you go down to, uh, down Route 9, we have a Walgreens and a CVS. This is a very similar layout. They, they have dumpster and, and loading areas on the side of the building. Uh, it's, it's pretty compact. They don't have a, necessarily really like a, a 30 yard dumpster. Uh, it's kind of offloaded in crates and stuff like that, uh, cardboard. And then their drive through would be on this side of the building. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the dumpsters and loading and, and access location. And like I said, as part of our submission, we have an emergency vehicle and a service vehicle truck maneuvering plan that will be submitted to the board. Uh, some drawdown calculations, some technical stuff uh, from a stormwater management perspective. Uh, if you want to go to the demolition and erosion control, sheet. So this is a little bit tough to read at this, at this, there you go, thank you. Uh, so this is what I refer to as detention basin five. It's tough, sorry for the quality here. Uh, but we're using three detention basins as temporary sedimentation basins. So during construction, uh, we have to control our stormwater runoff uh, and treat it and make sure it's contained during the construction process. Uh, and the reason for the three different basins, these three basins, five, six, and seven, are the ones that are closest to Flint Pond and they're within the 100 foot buffer <coughs> zone. So we have to build those first, stabilize them, and then use those as temporary sedimentation basins. One of Graves' comments were, if you're gonna use those three basins as temporary sedimentation basins, you can't excavate down all the way to the proposed finished elevation of that detention basin. He, wanted, he recommended leaving it a foot higher, and then after the tributary area go into that basin, you can then dig down that foot and once all the tributary areas stabilized with grass or you know uh, pavement or whatnot, uh, and then then that can function as a regular infiltration basin as designed. So during the construction process, those three basins will be used as temporary sedimentation basins, and we're going to add a note to our our roche control plan. Uh, our our set of plans is consists of basically a demolition and roche control. There's five sheets, I'm sorry for the amount of sheets in the package, uh, but that's just the scale limitations and sheet size limitations. There's a demolition and erosion control, grading and drainage plan, uh, utility plan, and then a parking trap control plan, and then a set of detail sheets. That's our typical standard uh, uh, site plan approval set, uh, and that's pretty much for every project. Uh, so our, this is a, just a portion of our demolition and erosion control. Some of the things I'd like to point out is a little bit tough to read, but this is what they refer to as a temporary drainage swale with hay bale check dams or wattle check dams. So it's a depression, it's a swale. So if they're building, <coughs> once they're like filling the market basket footprint, let's say, uh, they can direct the runoff to this temporary drainage swale. That temporary drainage swale brings it into the temporary detention basin. Uh, at the outlet structure of the detention basin, we do a temporary riser pipe wrapped in uh, crushed stone to protect the outlet from silty water leaving the site. And that's s standard for all three of these temporary sedimentation basins. So these, these, what they refer to as best management practices under the erosion <coughs> control aspects of the development and the construction, during construction, this moves around as, as the cut and fills happen on site. Uh, from a cut to fill perspective, uh, we try to balance the site as much as possible uh, just to make it economically viable. Uh, on this site, basically the knoll in the back in the residential area is the cut area. 
to a fill in the commercial area is what you'll see overall. Uh, the, uh, we've done uh, extensive soil testing on this site. We've, if we've done one test pit in boring, we've had to do 75 test pits and borings on this site. Uh, and it's for two as two, three reasons. One is for the stormwater management design. Uh, we have to, on all these basins, we have to establish estimated seasonal high groundwater and we have to uh, uh, estimate and retain what the infiltration rate is on all these basins. That was part of Graves' review. They concurred with <coughs> our estimated seasonal high groundwater elevations and our Rawls rates for all our detention basins, uh, or infiltration basins, I sh sorry. Uh, and then we do building testing as well because we want to know what type of foundation system we need to install. Is there a ledge on site? Those types of aspects. Is there an unsuitable people deposit on site that we have to be aware of? Uh, and obviously with a site this large, about 68 acres, uh, we're not developing all 68 acres, but with a site this large, uh, that's the reason for the amount of test pits and borings is to get the, a pavement section <coughs> to find out what the structural integrity of your building foundations is going to be and how you design your stormwater management analysis. So right after we do the existing condition survey, we hired a geotechnical engineer and they went through and did that extensive soil testing via test pits and borings throughout the commercial and the residential properties. Uh, that's just kind of giving you some background of uh, how, how we, the design parameters of some of the stormwater management. Uh, or allocated and got to. Uh, I think that's about it from a Graves review letter. Uh, oh, one thing uh, that they did, he did comment on, and I think it was part of Bernie's general planning comments as well, is we had a snow removal aspect. Uh, we've, I think uh, Mark handed the board a s snow removal narrative and plan, I do believe, if you want to call up the plan. Excuse me? Yeah. Can, can I get a copy of that and out, uh, if you have one? I, I think I might have an extra one. So what you'll see there is a narrative description of our snow management and removal process yeah, along with a associated plan. Uh, and Jonathan brought up this store water, the snow storage and management plan. All the snow storage is going to be initially contained within parking spaces. Uh, and the reason for that is not only where we don't, we're not allowed to obviously dump them in the wetlands and we'd like to keep them out of the 100 foot buffer. I would assume the Conservation Commission would like, doesn't want to see us dumping snow in the 100 foot buffer as well. Uh, but the, re the main reason why we do allocate the snow storage areas in pavement is when it melts, it goes through that treatment train. Uh, the, the catch basins with deep hoods and sumps, the water quality unit, and then it goes to the basin and gets treated from a water quality aspect before it discharges. Uh, so in, if, I don't know if I've talked <coughs> about this, but the commercial development is parked at about a 5.1 parking ratio, and the residential aspect is parked at about a 1.8 per unit. Uh, the town's requirement for units for residential is 1.5, the town's requirement for the commercial is uh, 4.0. So we're overparked, uh, and the reason for that is not only leaseability and marketability and user friendly for the like, market basket, they know what they need for parking. If you've ever been to the market basket in like Oxford, uh, that parking field gets filled up pretty quickly. Uh, so they've uh, realized that, and they say they know they need <coughs> right around a 5.0 in order to do their business uh, just based on their volume and turnover. Uh, however, these, these parking spaces that will be taken up by the snow storage, uh, if it ever becomes a real issue that it's taking up too much parking, it's either going to be removed from the site 
in this is both for the residential aspect and the commercial aspect, but in market baskets, they have an actually mechanical snow melting machine uh, that they can go to their critical sites uh, and melt the snow right on site rather than removing it and trucking it off site. And I think that does about 50 truckloads a day. Uh, that's how fast it can melt it. So uh, the, the, the property, man once again, the property manager is kind of in the control of the whole snow management removal plan. But they call Market Basket, I would assume, or DSM, and say, we've got a critical pile of snow that, and it's starting to impact the parking needs of the development. Uh, can you come out here tomorrow and start melting the snow to make those parking spaces available prior to the next storm? Well, that company, let's say they do the melting, right? Yep. So we know there's going to be two entities. You've got the residential and the commercial. Yep. Will the units that they're clearing the commercial be used in the residentials as well? Not necessarily. No. They'll, the, the, the snow management for each component will be separate and distinct. Uh, and those two property owners will agree on the management of the common areas, the access drives of, uh, and the like, uh, and, you know, allocate that responsibility. But the residential will have a separate company that will take care of snow uh, in a similar fashion. As Mr. Smith indicated, the snow storage areas within the residential components, and that will either be, uh, they'll either uh, contract for melting services if necessary or cart it off and off-site if, if required. I, <clears throat> I'd just like to make a comment about the snow storage area, that large area right across the front of the, of the parking lot. To me, that makes absolutely no sense in the fact that if you, like, see what White City is. So White City used to do the same thing. They piled all up around the perimeter of Route 9 in their parking lot, and the piles would get so high you couldn't see into the, you couldn't see into the plaza, nor when you were pulling out, it was hard to see around. So I don't think it makes any sense to pile up that mound of snow right in the front of the parking lot. I would think that you would need to find a better place than that one huge area to put it. Potentially agree. We'll take a look at that. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe we use some of that and move some of it. Yeah, I just else. that's yeah. a long way. Yeah, and it's and that's a big parking lot, and there's going to be a lot of snow piled up there, especially in a big storm. Obviously, so to me, that's going to make mountains of snow right on Route 20, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to cause problems for the entrances and exits. Not to mention, it's going to look unsightly for your tenant. Well, market basket. <laughs> Duly noted. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's it from a Graves perspective. Uh, from a, I think, uh, Bernie's, a lot of the general planning comments, I think Steve Dedarian of the Landscape Architect will go over and review, uh, unless there's something specific that... Do we want to take to questions about Graves before we go on to my letter and landscaping? That would make so sense. From the board and from the So does anyone on the board? Yes, Mr. Boyd. Uh, have you perked this land? If I perked it? Perked it for Yes. Us. Yep. Okay, because I know it's garbage under the asphalt. Yep. And I didn't know <coughs> if it perked. It perks at a very slow rate. But so it does perk. Yes, it does perk. <coughs> As a follow-up to Chairman's uh, earlier comment about the dumpsters, you know, like these are going to be some type of condominium complex, I would assume, and therefore there may not be town pickup or trash or recyclables. You may be taking care of the trash, but it, it may be too early at this stage to comment on that, but I think you should make sure that there is good provision for good recycling from the residential side. Commercial recycling, they'll take care of it, obviously, because there's obviously some benefit for them, but for the residents to do good recycling, I think you should work with, yeah. with whoever is the property owner sure. to make sure that there's recycling provision there. All the refuse for <coughs> the entire site will be done privately. Um, and um, it is not intended that the residential will be condominium. In fact, it'll be a single owner who will have rental development, so will have a vested interest in making sure that it stays neat and, and operational um, as far as that's concerned. And um, at the time that we talk about architecture and the building design, we'll have that um, some of those designers talk about the features even within the buildings to uh, 
make sure to uh, encourage uh, recycling efforts in some fashion. Questions, uh, Nope, not at this time. <coughs> I, if I might, Mr. Chairman, what I did want to point out just procedurally is that we did discuss when we got together um, the issue of revisions to the plans, and as opposed to issuing now a set of plans for revision and get another round from Graves, uh, we felt, uh, I think, collectively it would be better to hold off on revisions until we had both this meeting, uh, a meeting on traffic and circulation, and then be able to submit more, a more comprehensive set of revisions rather than keep going back and forth on the same uh, number, so as to reduce the number of revisions that will be done. So there'll be a revision set that'll come somewhere later in the process, obviously while the hearing's still open, that'll be subject to further review by Graves to confirm everything that's in the review letter. Okay. Is the um, planning department amenable to that? Yes. Anybody else have any issue with I'm that? Fine. Okay, fine. sounds good. Thank you. All right. Is there any, are there any other questions from the board? No. Is there anyone in the audience who's to be heard relative to the Gray's response? Sorry, I believe you were going to ask a I question. I have a question, but I, maybe I'm in the wrong area. I, I was. My Excuse me. Did you identify about, yourself? I'm sorry. Identify yourself. Oh, Ed Defuber. I own some property on Lake Street and across from uh, Omni 20 as well. And my concerns I asked for the last time was I, I understood that they were going to widen Route 20, 20, right? But I further understood that there was a $3.5 million grant to promote sewerage in that area. And I was thinking that it should come from Flynn down to Lake Street and from the Edgemere Diner to Lake Street and then up Lake Street. It makes sense to me if you're going to, if you're going to renovate and re redo the road, the, all of Route 20, that section of Route 20, I would think you would put the sewerage in, connect it to Flint, down to Lake Street, and from the Edgemere Diner to Lake Street, and then up Lake Street. That, to me, is common sense. The other concern I had was uh, they talked about having a pumping station. You have 68 acres of land there. And I don't see why the pumping station shouldn't be confined within that area. The other concern I have is, and I don't know, there may be two entrances and exits, are there? Or is it just the one? There's two. There's two. There's two. So there's one on the right and the left as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that I like. But I'm concerned about the storage, concerned about the water line, where it goes. Um, basically, those are my concerns. I have... I have a concern about the traffic that will be generated from there because I have a bus company who's been with me for right, 15, but 20 years. We're not years. discussing traffic this evening. Though. Sorry? I said we're not discussing traffic. I understand that's a general comment for you. That's, okay. We're not on a topic for traffic today. But how about the sewage? Can we discuss that? Sewage we can discuss. So okay, please. I can give some insight on, on what I know as far as from sewer and water perspective uh, for the board and for the gentleman in the audience. Uh, if you could flip to the parking and traffic control plan. Uh, maybe the existing conditions would be better. Yeah, there we go. Uh, from a sewerage perspective, right now, there is a dry line that comes from the Edgemere Diner. I'm aware of that. Yeah, it's a dry line, and it comes actually down here. Right. And the town installed that, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, maybe. It's not that long ago, but yeah. I remember it happening, and then I was also told, uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't hook up to that uh, line. Yeah, and the, the reason being is it needs a pump station. Right, okay. Okay? So my concern... Right. Excuse me, sir. Fine. Sir? Sir? What about from the Excuse top me. of the hill sir? to the bottom? Excuse me. I, I think he's trying to answer your question. Okay. Please address all your questions all through right. the chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, so there's a dry system. It's, it's not used. And it needs a, it goes to a low spot right here on Lake Street. Uh, they were trying to get a pump station for years and years. Uh, they finally secured the town has finally secured rights for that municipal pump station on aggregate property. Uh, and they're in the process of getting construction drawings out to bid to build that pump station. So once that pump station is built, they've also entered the town has also entered into an intermunicipality sewer agreement with the city of Worcester uh, to pump the flows in this area of the town over down Route 20, as you can, if anybody has been driving Route 10, 20 recently, 
that Worcester has already constructed the sewer mains, and that's the reason why it's all a mess, uh, the road on Route 20 in Worcester. Uh, they've already <coughs> connected and built their portion of the sewer mains. Shrewsbury is going to do the same and, and switch <coughs> over this pump station on, Lo on Lake Street and pump it down the new sewer mains and new pump stations over to the what they refer to as the Upper Blackstone Wastewater Treatment Plant in Worcester. It's actually in Millbury, right off of Route 20 there. Uh, so we, as part of that process, this, this line will become active in, in, I would assume, all these parcels in and around this area of town will be able to tie into that, that sewer system at some point in time. Okay, but my question And that's also is going to service this property as well. The question, though, is coming from Flynn's down to Lake Street. Why wouldn't that be part of the process? Perhaps I could probably answer that better, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, that would be part. Of, there's two phases to the sewer design. The phase one is from here, the new lake station, up to the Worcester line. Um, and you uh, tell them who you are. I'm Andy Truman, senior civil engineer with the town of Shrewsbury, uh, also acting water and sewer commissioner. Um, so that Lake Street pump has actually been awarded. Construction is starting this year. That pump station will be installed by the end of this year and be online. So that dry sewer will be diverted to that pump station and will pump up to the Blackstone. Valley. That's phase one. Phase two is still, which is from here to Flynn's all the way down, is still a, a phase, is what we call phase two, and that is still out there being designed and looked at, but it's not. Well, why, if they're, they are going to widen Route 20, why then wouldn't they put the sewerage from Flynn's to Lake Street? Well, we are putting, we're going to put a sewer in, but it won't, it's not going to be, it's going to be a dry line. It won't be active for many years. I mean, yes, I mean, the infrastructure will be installed, but we're not going to allow connections to it. So you're going to put it there, uh, dry line like you did earlier in this other thing? Mm -hmm. So you can't use it? Not yet, no. And what's the, what's the time frame for something that? Like could that could be a, a year or two. There are, there are a couple of things floating right now, options, but phase two was always a, a long-term plan to, to do that part of the sewer. So if I understand you correctly then, they will be coming down with a dry line from Flint's to Lake Street? Well, Flint's is actually, there's a hill between here and Flint's, so they would have to pump up to the top of the hill and then run a, there is a gravity sewer that's going to be from here to the top of the hill which is going to get put in as part of this route turning widening so we're going to put that in now and that's where it will stop so if i can, I can borrow that. so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting in you know when they do the widening we're going to be putting in a dry, the dry sewer up to here which is the top of the hill right the issue is then we've got to pump from flint up to that and that's the part that hasn't and are we talking a couple of years or are we talking 20 years? It could happen in a year, yeah, it could be next couple of years, it could be 10 years. It's could. still being designed. Well, I've been, I've been okay. told sewage is coming in Route 20 since I was uh, 15 years old. Now it's finally coming, but again, we can't hook up to it. Right. Excuse me, sir, I think what you're asking for is really relative to the town activities yeah, for the continuation of the sewer, project. not necessarily tied to the specific project. So I would request well, that how you... How long, as far as time frame goes and, and traffic goes, how long a period of time would it be to complete that section going up Lake Street, pumping station and all that? So I think that's... Because again, that's, that's outside of the purview that's of, this of this board. Project. That's not. So this board can't answer that question. We have to stay focused. This board has to stay focused on this project and what's relevant to this project. I think Andy's done a good job answering your questions. If you have any more, you can meet with engineering. Um, outside of this meeting, but um, for the purposes of this evening, I think this board is focused on this project and what pertains to this subject matter. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. When it fails, where is the stuff going to go? Well, turn it into another situation like Worcester, where it all goes right into the pond, right into the lake? Well, no, I mean, the, um, as far as I know, we've breaks, never had a pump. No. It breaks. Where does it go? Dennis Ryan's rule. Yes, he did. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, they don't break. I mean, they're, they're maintained on a regular basis by the t by the town. It has an emergency generator. It's a brand new pump station. It's. It breaks. Well, Worcester may have issues with broken. Shrewsbury doesn't. Have issues where you should be familiar on what's happening in Worcester. Oh, I live in Worcester. Yeah. You live in Worcester. So you know that you take everything from Belmont Hill, you pump it down to the pumping station. Pumping station breaks. It all goes in the lake. So where is the overflow going to go 
on this pumping station. It's at the bottom of the hill. Yes, but I don't foresee that being an issue. So. But you got to know where it's going. Andy, is that uh, uh, an old style piping? No, it's all. One is above the other. No, it's all separate. Yeah, no, it's okay. it's a separate system. And I say it's it's, it's been designed. <coughs> the, the pump station designed to handle the flow from this project and most of the Route 20s, you know, that's okay. bound. So. <coughs> what happened with the Pumps Sorry. Pump Sorry, I'm not sure that we are in a position to answer that particular question at this time. Well, you should try to figure out where this is going to go. Because I'm going to rely. Excuse me. I'm going to rely on the engineering department to evaluate their pumping station. And based on our experience, we will dis determine whether or not additional measures need to happen to contain a potential spill should that should one occur. And what, what's going to happen with the sewer that's there now if they build this project? And this pump ain't in operation. I believe this pump will be in operation prior to this. this yeah, this pump station will be online probably the end of this year, beginning of this year. So the, it's already it's already out to bid. We've already awarded it. We're actually gear and start construction within the next month or so, and it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, that's the retaining ponds that they want to put on the property. Now you're talking that you want to keep the snow up in the winter when everything's frozen. Those retaining ponds ain't going to handle that amount of water. That ground's frozen. Would you care to address that? The the ponds are designed uh, to be outside and above the estimated season high groundwater. Uh, the ponds are also function as a detention basin. Uh, obviously, obviously during winter conditions, the ground gets frozen, but there's still storage capacity in the basin, and it's designed in accordance with the mass stormwater policy. So this is not in an aquifer district. Our uh, aquifer, um, according to Mass DEP, it is, is not. <laughs> um, at least uh, our aquifer is outlined on our, uh, I believe, on the it's on our <coughs> website. I think yeah. so. We have yeah, the ta our town wells are actually no located further north by, much further north by, up what, by the north 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 segment. Winter um, sand, sand and gravel. They're all that 290 yep. area. That's where all our wells are. So we're not. The we don't have an aquifer center down there. that was built. That's kind of that region. Post office. Built, when I build my well for my property, it's either in an aquifer and they can't pump it dry. And if the town messes my well up over this project, I'll be looking for it. Well, you have to go to well, the planning so and engineering should, should that occur. My card's over there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, any other questions from the audience? Can I just ask one more question? Yes, sir. Is that line that would be from Flynn's to Lake Street, would that be a gravity fed line? Coming down the hill? Well, coming down the hill, yes. I'm, 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 my real Again, it's, it's, it's not been designed, so I don't know. It, but it, Flynn's is lower than the high point there. It would have to be. We have an intercept. We have a main sewer that comes through that we have to intercept. So, But again, that's not really related to this project. So. Again, sir, that's way outside the purview of this hearing. If you have specific questions relative to the sewer line from Flynn's down to this process, I expect I would ask you that you just go to the engineering department tomorrow or whenever you have time available and you can take this online with the engineers. Thank you. Anyone else? That's yes, sir. That's a retaining pond. They didn't say exactly what that building was. It's going to be on the west side of the property. They all talked about what's going on there and what's going on the east, but they didn't say what that building to the west is going to be. Go to the park and traffic. So the, I would assume this re, this is considered dry good retail right now, and that's the way it's parked in, in per zoning. Uh, that's the way it's parked. This is a bank out parcel would, would drive through. Right now, we do, the tenants are unknown, so that could change in the future. Excuse, sir, that'll, that'll be addressed when they go in front of conservation. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, so why don't we move on to uh, Bernie's comment letter? So I think I'll go through this um, similar to what we did with um, Graves' comments. So I'll skip the administrative comments that I had uh, or the ones that were already addressed. We've already talked about snow storage and a couple other things. Um, so I'll just hit the um, larger points. Uh, so one of them was, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, uh, so number seven was um, on page three, there's a reference to a large gathering area offering cafe table seating areas alongside the Easterly Residential Drive. Um, the plans, I just put the plans don't label that and I was wondering if that was the dog park? I, Cause I wasn't sure, this is by Cube 3 Studio, so maybe yeah. you don't know, but. Okay. No, we, uh, I think it's, it, just not labeled on the landscape plans. Okay. It's the it's the amenity area in the east side of the abutting retail the next market. door to market okay. basket. It's in that landscaped island. That's what that is. That's what that's okay. referring to. And that will be labeled on the on the plans. All right. Next time. Because when they said along the eastern Bernie, if, drive. If, if you don't mind, Jim. Uh, Maybe we have the landscape architect because he may yep. answer a lot of your questions. Oh, okay. Uh, if if um, you're open to that, uh, uh, there were a couple. Let me hit the okay. things that yeah. you might just um, to bring to your attention. Um, the board brought to my attention actually that um, to please include legends on, on the, all the pages that you can, um, even if they're amended legends. So like particularly to that page, um, just for the public. And yeah. I, if the board's having trouble finding what is matching up with symbols, I'm, I'm sure the public is too, so. Yeah, there, uh, are, there is an overall legend sheet as part of our notes sheet. Yeah. Some notes, abbreviation, legends, uh, yeah. all is one, and it's one table, and just constraints from a, from a plan perspective, if you look at it, we don't really have much room to put a legend yeah. on each individual sheet. That's so I, like. I appreciate that uh, we can we can pare it down and make the legend specific to that drawing. So if it's a rose control, then it will show the rose control legend yeah. existing proposed, uh, and we'll add that to the sheets. I we'll, think that's we'll do best. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other one was, um, and they're not here this evening, but they reminded me of it when they brought it up. Was the um, those? Uh, so we need. We're gonna have to have two additional sheets to show um, buildings within 200 feet of the property line. So I think the. Um, the buildings to the east and west there along 20. So we're gonna have to have additional sheets just to show that. Yes, um, that's correct. A, no, I'll keep that comment. Um, we're gonna talk about green buildings and that technology at a different day with architecture is my understanding. So we'll leave those comments out. Um, and we talked about <coughs> snow. For the slope grading, I don't know if this is, you can probably just answer it yep. outright was, um, this came up, I forget who we were talking to, one of these guys, about the, um, the oh no, I know who it was. Um, it was internal, the planning department itself. Was, we were talking internally about the, um, the graded slopes along the edges of some of those uh, detention basins. Will those be green slopes or will those be riprap? Or? All slopes on the site has been designed to be green slopes. They will be, uh, okay. They've been designed to be three to one slopes so they can be loomed and seeded. Any slope steeper than two and a half to one will receive a road control matting. Okay. Per our detail, and that will be part of our response. And we did that. I think that was. I think everything else. I think Graves and I had a couple of duplicate comments, so mm -hmm. I think we've covered everything. That was it, Mr. Chairman, if you wanted to move to. Uh, <coughs> Does anyone else have anything based on Bernie's comments that you want to discuss? No. Is anyone in the public wish to talk about anything that you may not have seen in Bernie's comments, but uh, of the items that he brought up? Okay, so I think at this time we should probably bring up the uh, landscaper. Thank sure, you. just to, to tee it up, you've, you've really only seen the, the, the uh, in the public forum, we've only talked about the plan at this scale of the whole thing. So this is an opportunity to drill down a little bit and see some of the detail that's been brought to it, particularly it relates to the amenity areas, some of the front buffer at the, the doorstep to make it an inviting area, and some of the other features. So uh, Steve Dadarian from BHB is the landscape architect who has been working on the, uh, the project. And as opposed to trying to drill down on every species and the like, what I've asked them to do is just kind of highlight some of the key points.
and we're allowed to spend as much detail as you want, either now or in the future, uh, on any specific portions that you want. So. Good evening. Uh, for the record, I'm Steve Videri. I'm the landscape architect with VHB. Um, I'd like to give you an overview of the project and a little bit of detail, but not too much, <laughs> so I won't bore you. Um, let's see. Let me get the camera to go. You tell that good looking guy no, no, to no, move no, it. How do you get the pointer? Oh, the pointer is the red right button. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Basically, let's go to the overall. Okay. Uh, basically, the way the project is organized is, okay, we have residential cluster, this location, residential cluster, this location, uh, market basket, retail, and additional commercial off to the sides. And the site is organized by having essentially a tree-lined boulevard uh, wrapping around the entire uh, developed area and providing connectivity, both vehicular and, you know, what's beeping? You don't have to hold the button down. I'm not. Oh. That's <laughs> interesting. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I won't use the button. Okay. Um, it, the uh, boulevard is tree-lined, but it provides connectivity, both vehicular and pedestrian. There's, okay, I'll be careful on that. Okay, there's a walk that wraps around the entire site, providing connectivity. And within each of the clusters, there's also uh, a lot of different uh, walkway opportunities um, off in this area as well. Uh, they're naturalized to a large degree with plantings. Um, and the residential areas are particularly heavily planted. Um, in terms of amenities, uh, we've provided amenities throughout the site. The area that was being spoken about earlier, the large gathering area, okay, is located in this space here. It's about a 7,500 square foot area, and it offers uh, benches, tables, um, you know, uh, perennial plantings, uh, shade trees, um, a lot of things of interest. Um, and we view it as it's actually a kind of an ideal location because it's, it's near both to the retail, but it's also proximate to residential. Uh, the dog park that was mentioned earlier is actually located here. That's about 12,000 square feet or so. And additional amenity areas, uh, more personal scale, located at this location, um, located here, here, as well as here. Um, in terms of entrances to the site, uh, we have two gateway entrances, which are uh, characterized by New England vernacular stone walls <coughs> leading you into the site, uh, framed by tree plantings and layered landscaping uh, in the front of those. Um, also highlighting signage in both locations. Um, in terms of the uh, front buffer area that was discussed earlier, um, the way we've worked this is we, we looked at the, uh, the bylaw and it shows a preference for clustering trees rather than having a single row 25 feet on center of trees across the frontage. And it indicates a 10 foot wide deep area that they should occur within. Um, we've taken that to heart and clustered the trees uh, in groupings along these areas <coughs> um, as well as along this area really to naturalize the space as much as possible and with the trees in the center we've actually used it says canopy trees but in this one location we've used ornamental trees really to get uh, the flowering effect seasonal effect uh, the idea being that as people drive by through spring and fall in particular uh, that there will be a lot of visual interest along this edge and really add a lot of quality uh, to that edge. Um, in terms of the 10 foot width, we sprayed a little bit with our groupings through here, but I understand there is some discretion as far as how that might be applied. And we've done this as landscape architects, viewing it as how do we best utilize the space and optimize it for plantings. Um, also the 10 foot width kind of steers you towards having trees up towards areas that are gonna get winter de-icing salt, uh, which will harm the trees. So we've pulled them back a little bit. So we're getting the proper number of trees, but clustered and really uh, framing the entrances and framing views into the site as well. If I might, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, th this issue in particular will require a waiver 
uh, because your, uh, the, the requirements right now say 25 foot off center are requirements. So it might be worth drilling down on the, on the closer plan that you have so okay. the board can, okay. can address this and understand any issues when we do ask for the waiver. Okay. Um, one of the things that was brought up also is there are areas uh, that have some gaps. We intentionally left areas without trees here uh, because we have entrance signage in that location and we want people to be able to see that. Um, they also address this in the bylaw as far as an exception uh, for areas to allow for sight lines around corners and we've done that through here. Um, the frontage requirement also um, basically states that areas of drives, et cetera, coming in are not included as part of that. So we've taken our measurements along the frontage in these sections through here and worked our plantings in with the clusters of plantings, with shade trees, uh, with ornamental trees at the entrances um, to give a really high quality experience and also uh, setting them back from the road some so they're less likely to uh, be damaged by road salt. How large are the trees going to be to start? The trees will be, let's see, I've got that right here, uh, two and a half to three inch caliper, which is in accordance with the zoning bylaw. Now, I don't know if that'll work. Why is that? Because the land there is garbage. Oh, well, we can over, basically we could design a, a detail as far as a tree planting that provides additional planting medium around the trees, okay, to give that them a better chance. That probably would be a good idea. Yeah, so we can consider doing that. And in terms of screening, um, behind Market Basket, we have an extensive evergreen screen. And actually, Roy, if you could pull the board out of the way, yeah. you could just take it down. Yeah, yeah that's fine, thank you. Um, by the residential abutter along this edge, we've introduced an extensive uh, deciduous shade tree, canopy tree screen. Um, since the residents are up high, the development's down low, this will get the canopy up where in time as it really matures, they'll get a, a basically a secondary screen to the existing screen as well. Um, other areas, you know, we have extensive wooded areas on the site uh, that provide screening. And let's see, in terms of the parking areas, um, what we've done is uh, we've exceeded the 5% requirement by quite a bit. I think uh, Roy, in many cases, like 9% yeah, in that kind of a range, nine, 7 to 9%. And what we've done is we've introduced uh, linear islands, you know, every three bays through here, both to break up the massing of the parking and also to uh, mitigate the heat island effect of a large paved area, uh, introducing canopy trees into those areas uh, to shade the pavement as well as along the end islands. And that's a pretty typical treatment uh, throughout the parking areas. Even with the linear parking areas, we've uh, included trees on islands to break those up. So as you drive along, it's not just endless cars, it's, it's also canopy trees through there. Um, and in terms of lighting, I think a, a question came up um, to make sure that it's uh, dark skies compliant, it is. Um, the lighting that's being used is all LED lighting, uh, which is state of the art. Um, it by its nature is able to direct the light directly down to the area you want to light without having light trespass. And another huge advantage of it is it's very long live. You don't have to change, change these out for 10 years or so. Um, and it's incredibly energy efficient. Um, the equivalent of a 60 watt bulb is like seven or eight watts with an LED in it gives you the same for the candles. And I think that gives you an overview um, of how we're approaching the site. Um, I might say also that just in meeting the regs and also the quality standards that the developer is aiming for, uh, we have some 300 shade trees introduced as part of this project and over 200 ornamental trees as well. Um, and you'll see on this also, it's particularly evident on your plants that these darker green areas are the ground cover uh, and shrub areas. Uh, that one exception that was taken, oh, you don't have a continuous landscape strip. We actually do. It's um, in terms of ground cover, perennial shrubs, it does carry continuously across uh, the front of the site. But it's also introduced extensively within the site so that as you walk around residential areas, you walk along the roads, you'll always experience you know, canopy trees uh, as well as low level <coughs> plantings. 
So <clears throat> back to the, I'm not a horticulturist, okay? <laughs> That's fine. So when you put these trees in, what size will they be? I know, you, you, is it two and a half to three is the starting point? Yes. And then what will they grow to? Oh, uh, well, with the shade trees, I've been around a while. I mean, I've had projects that were planted two and a half inch caliper trees that uh, 15 years later are like 12 inch caliper trees. So they will mature into uh, large shade trees. Uh, most, many of the trees we're using are natives, uh, such as maples and oaks. And so you're probably familiar with those as far as you know, oak trees get up about 70 feet tall. Uh, maple is about 50, 60 feet tall. So you come back to the site 10 years out from now, I think you'll have quite a lush landscape, even just 10 years out. And you know that they all need to be Asian longhorn beetle. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Through you, do you think this land will uh, support growth of trees? As I said, I, I think the land's garbage. Mm. And therefore, I'm not sure you're gonna get the growth that you expect. And you might wanna start, I don't know if you it, can start bigger. Well, it, it might, be to, to the gentleman's question, if I might, Mr. Chairman, it might be worth having Mr. Smith kind of review the cut and fill plan because there is a fair amount of earth being moved around. So it's, it's not being planted essentially, if you drove by now and started to dig a hole, um, and if that would be helpful, maybe we can maybe review yes. that briefly. Once they get to the site, obviously there's the existing deteriorated pavement associated with the former drive-in. Uh, that's going to be ripped up and removed and probably stockpiled and processed. Uh, and we might use that as pavement gravels. We might not use that as pavement gravels uh, in the future. But there's an extensive existing woods. Uh, in, in woods, it's what they refer to as forest mat, which is a, a form of loom. It's not the best loom in the world. Uh, but in the wo existing wooded areas, which we're disturbing probably about 10 acres of woods uh, that we have to clear and then grub, pull out the stumps, and then strip that forest mat, what they refer to as forest mat, stockpile it, they can process that and amend that, that forest mat to make it a good suitable planting material for the tree beds, the shrubs, and the seeded lawns, uh, the leaves and seeded lawns. Uh, it's pretty, pretty thick. The, the forest mat varies as you, depending upon where you are on site, uh, but it varies from anywhere from six inches to a foot and a half thick. Uh, so we're going to have, we're probably going to have excess loom <coughs> when it's all said and done that will either be processed, amended, and used on site in planting tree pits or shrub areas or lawn areas, uh, or be hauled off and sold uh, as loom to another developer or another This is not property. a balance site, is it? No, it's not a balance site. There's, uh, you're, you're right, the soils are not that great. The pavement gravels and the building gravels will not be coming from an on-site source. Those will have to be from, brought in from an off-site source. So you, you're correct in your statement that the, the existing soils are not what, like we could dig this out, this cut area in process and get our process gravels. Uh, for the pavement, for underneath the building foundations and what whatnot, but that material is going to have to be from a borrow site uh, on this. So it's not a it's not a balanced site uh, just by the f nature of the forest mat, the existing pavement, uh, and so forth and so on. It's a it's a fill needed site of what they refer to as a borrow site. And I'm not sure if this falls under the landscaping, but I think it may fall into this particular meeting set. So the artifact areas that were delineated earlier, how are we going to mark them and how much of a buffer are we putting around them to ensure they don't get disturbed? Well, it, it's a little bit um, counterintuitive, maybe, but actually the desires of the regulatory authorities is that the area not be designated in any fashion rather it be designed so that it's an undisturbed area. 
So without pointing out where it is uh, in that plan, there's an area in which there's no development that's occurring, nor would occur in the future, uh, that'll be restricted, that'll be that. But from the regulatory authorities, they would rather not say that this is an area that has historical artifacts because it might encourage people to go look for those artifacts and they won't try to leave them there. Um, so there's a particular pocket of the site uh, that um, that uh, uh, certainly uh, influenced the location of uh, one of the buildings on the westerly side. Uh, that is the area that's been previously designated. I'm more concerned about the construction aspect to ensure that while they're clearing and so forth that we it's, mark off. It's, it's an clearly. area that's shown on the, the plan set and therefore it'll be in the construction set. And so during construction, it will be protected in a fashion analogous to a wetland area. Okay. It'll be flagged, marked, you know, temporary fences, you know, protections in some fashion. In the long run, it will just blend back into native areas. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions relative to the landscaping at the moment? No, sir. Um, and I, I might have missed this on the plan sheet because there's just a lot of information, obviously. Um, if it's not already there and I haven't been able to find it, would it be possible just for the, um, to, to go with the zoning bylaw, which requires the uh, canopy tree per 25 linear feet of frontage, would it be possible to put in a table showing required and then what's being proposed so we, the board yep. can see for canopy trees? Um, <coughs> that the numbers are matching up. I'm not sure what you were referring to with the waiver. Um, oh, that was in regard to the having the trees within 10 feet. Clustering right each of other? Way. Oh, of the right of way. Um, right, but they also, in the next sentence, talk about that it's desirable to put the trees in groupings. Right. And so that would kind of stray them out of the 10 feet in any case. Right. And we would have trees in the 10 feet, for okay. sure, but we'd set them back as much as we can, basically, from the road to protect them from salt. <coughs> I see. So that, okay. that's one area. Right. The no, other, go ahead. other area that I was considering that I just put out there for you is with, it's no difference in cost between a canopy tree and ornamental tree. And it would be great if we could use some of the trees along the frontage as ornamental trees, meaning flowering trees, mm. um, simply to get a, a much nicer visual effect instead of having all shade trees. Um, Can you explain that to me? Yes. A canopy tree is what? Canopy tree is typically uh, what we call like a shade tree, like a large maple, okay. oak, um, trees like that. Um, an ornamental tree would be something more like a, a river birch would be considered ornamental, dogwoods, um, you know, flowering cherry, this kind of a thing. That gives you seasonal, you know, some spring effect, really. So one is more a shade tree yes. than the other. One is larger, you know. The canopy tree does get larger in time. Although river birds get pretty large. So like the ornamental trees, I believe, would be like the ones that are on Route 9 in the median that flower in the spring and they don't right. get overly, li they're like flowering pears or chantilly right. chanticleer pears. Yeah. And we're using predominantly canopy trees, but we're using ornamental trees really to highlight areas, entrances. Thank you very thing. much. Thank you. So I think having that table for the, the um, front yard landscaping to show okay. the canopy numbers versus, and then if you are going to be under a few, that's... We can yep. discuss it then what we'll do, but um, that's fine. Yeah, clustering isn't an issue. I mean, it is actually allowed in, I'm reading it right now, in the Route 20 overlay to cluster instead of yep. having a contiguous line. So that's not, don't, wouldn't you have a waiver for the clustering? Right. <laughs> just, the, just the count. Um, I think that's all I had. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there any questions relative to landscaping from the audience? There being none, I don't believe there's anything else that we're planning on covering this evening. However, I would like to suggest that um, the September meeting, um, it sounds like we're not going to be on schedule for a traffic analysis at that, is that, at that point. Is that still correct? I think that's, that's accurate. Um, this concerns um, MDM, your peer review consultant, still working on their report. It is August, so I'm not sure I can commit that we'll have time to digest it. The process that we use for civil is one that works well, and that is we get the, the, the report from your peer review and then have a chance to sit and review it and before we prepare our response. And I don't think there's enough time given August to try to get that done. So whether the board wants to entertain a special meeting in September or go to October for that, 
Uh, I would say. Haven't we already got a special meeting? We haven't, discussed it. we haven't discussed it yet. Oh. We're, we're working on it now. <laughs> All right. So, given the fact that traffic. Get over time. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. Given the fact that traffic was initially scheduled for next month, and it looks like we're not going to be positioned to do that, I suggest that we plan on three other topics instead. Um, first, uh, well, actually, yeah, three of them. It's uh, the fiscal impacts, housing, and architecture. Do you feel we'll be in a position to discuss those items? What are they, sir? Fiscal impacts? Fiscal impacts, housing, and architecture. You feel pretty good about that one? Um, I hadn't contemplated candidly doing a fiscal impact analysis to update the one that was submitted to this board and others as part of the 2017 rezoning. Um, and so I don't know whether, if what the board's asking us to do is to update that report, mm -hmm. whether I have to engage that person and get them to do it, um, and whether you can get that done, I can't commit right now. Okay. Um, we certainly can do architecture and had thought about that. Um, housing, do you, are you referring mostly to the affordable component or housing style? I think style? just the housing, which includes the architecture of it, the units, the, you know, the, the whole the thing that has to That's do fine. with housing. Sure. Um, housing, the, the general category of housing will be well ready to talk about. Architecture for both the commercial and the residential will be able to talk about. Um, the fiscal impact I just can't commit to because I and wasn't aware of that. We can have that as a... Sure. If, if, if we can. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we did discuss among ourselves, uh, we would be able to be available to have a, an additional meeting in September on the 17th, which is a Tuesday. Um, would that give you sufficient time to give us a topic? You can let us know at the September meeting what that topic would be. Sure. Um, or if, if you don't feel that we have the need or you have the materials ready, then we just don't have to do the September 17th meeting. I, I would know. I would fully hope, um, but it's easy for me to hope because I'm making promises for other people to do work, that we'd be ready to do the traffic and circulation that night. Okay. I think it would be best for the transportation to have it standalone just because I think it's going to be such a wide-ranging and long topic. So if we have a special meeting, I think it would be worth the board's while since everyone's taking time out of their life schedule to be here, that it's, it's going to be something that is worth everyone's time and productive and so I think if it's not transportation if it's not possible then I would recommend putting off we could always do one at a later date for yeah, transportation I, I that. does that seem reasonable mm -hmm. okay okay yes sir uh, is this sewage thing closed or may I make a comment about that or is that going to come up as long as it's relative to the site then it's you very can make relative to the site just so maybe I'm misinformed but I I was of the understanding that there was a $3.5 million grant to bring sewerage along Route 20, okay? Now, I happen to own property right across the street from the other exit or entrance. I'm sure those people are going to have sewerage. I don't think it was intended to have a $3.5 million grant to only accommodate one particular area. I think it was should be or should have been to accommodate Route 20 from uh, Edina to Edgemere, Edina to Flint. And in no way should I not be allowed to hook up to sewerage if it's right across the street in another building and you're going to have it pumped from there down and up, up uh, Lake Street. Why, if I'm right across the street, should I be able to allow to tap in? I think you should take that up with the planning department. Sorry? So not the planning department. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're going to have to take this up with the water and sewer department and the engineering department. This is well beyond the powers or the expertise of this board. They do not have the power to, over any of that. So but my understanding, if you do something like that, if you have a grant, it's for the common good. It's not only for one particular building that's an argument that you can have with someone else in town but not the planning board yeah, I, um, you, you, it's I, also my understanding Andy can correct me if I'm wrong the mass works grant was for the road it's for the road improvements not correct. the sewer improvements so that 3.5 million mass works grant was for the road improvements that's for the widening of route 20 the widening of route 20 the extra lanes not for sewer improvements well still my point is <laughs> if you have sewage directly across the street from a person's property 
I would think it should still be for the common good of everybody along the swing to have this over, not only to limit it to that particular area. Yeah, I would get in touch with the selectmen. I would get in touch with the engineering department, but I don't think this board can help yeah, you. We have nothing to do with that. Even if they agreed with everything you said, they still don't have the power to do anything about it. Um, We're just here for that project. All right. Okay. So is there another hearing about the sewerage or is there not? We're done with the in-depth talking about sewerage or civil, but we will always have an opportunity at the end of the hearing to do a roundup of any additional questions that, that you can think of between now and the final close. Okay. And the engineering department's open every day okay. from 8 to 4.30. Definitely so much more helpful than we can be. And is Andy... I would be, yes. I do engineering <laughs> and water and sewer right now. Yeah, Andy. Truman. Truman. Okay. I can give you my card afterwards, but yeah. Okay. I can answer probably a lot of your questions. It's just not really pertinent to this project. Okay. Is there any other questions or com comments about this particular hearing? No, sir. Okay. I, I entertain a motion to... Can I just say something? I just got a question. Sure. This development that's going in, how's that going to affect the duck hunting on the pond? I can't answer that. That's a conservation issue. And it's not up. And know, it's not our, it's not not our purview. purview. Well, can I ask them what their view is on people hunting on their wranglers? Because there's three or four duck blinds that are there right now. Well, again, a private civil matter? That that's wouldn't a, be a matter for the planning oh, board. I'm sorry. Okay, so I will entertain a motion to continue. The Move edge. to continue. Hold on a second. I'm not done yet. <laughs> The Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond Mas Market Basket Project Site Plan and Special Permit to uh, Thursday, September 5th, 2019 at 7 p.m. Does anybody, would you like to, now you can do a move. I can do it now? Yes, you can. <laughs> I'd like to continue. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Perna. Taking me. Thank you, Perna. Okay. The next order of business is actually new business. We have a request for a bond reduction, Oak Meadow Farm subdivision. Mr. Cahill. Uh, I have it right here. Um, you can read it out. This is for the Oak Meadow Farm subdivision. Um, Town engineering has been out to the site. Excuse me, can, can we have the conversations, please? Thank you. Uh, our field engineering inspector has been out to the site to review it and to confirm what work has been done and what work is outstanding. Uh, and planning board, and, I'm sorry, planning department and engineering department recommend approval of this reduction. I can show you, you can read off the amounts off the reduction itself, if you will. Uh, you can just say what it's for, how much it's being reduced by. It says it right on it. Just the total account? Okay, so this is oh, a I'm request. I'm going to recuse myself. You're recusing That's yourself? That's just a month. Oh. Yes. Oh, okay. I won't okay. be voting. Okay, so the amount to be uh, the present balance for the Oak Meadow Farm subdivision um, credit union account number 2005, two, 20050 currently has a total of $94,400. The amount to be retained would be $63,100. So the amount to be released is $31,300. Does anybody have any questions or comments relative to that, other than Mr. Rolakis? No, sir. Um, motion. I move that we approve the bond reduction by $31,300. Plus interest accru occur accrued. I can't read, sorry. Four. Four. Can I see that, sir? Sure. I'm trying to read it, sorry. That's okay. For Oak Meadow Farm Subdivision, Book 912, page 115, bond reduction with Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union, account number 20050. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The oh, other, Bill's uh, not in the room, so he won't sign it. What's that? He's not going to sign it, yeah, because of the yeah. not a big <laughs> Okay. It's only a majority anyway, so I would have told you to wait. Okay. So that's fine. Uh, uh, the next okay. business is discuss and vote on the issuance of bond for 14 Fortune Boulevard. 
Uh, this is the site that came before you and was approved earlier uh, in May and then amended again in uh, June um, over on Fortune Boulevard next to the Columbia Gas Training Site. Um, I can let I can let Jay read it out if you will. The, just the top and then the amount what the bonds for. Just the highlighted area then. Okay. Uh, it's for Southworth Milton Incorporated, 100 Corey Drive, Milton, Ma Milford, Mass. 01757, for the sum of nineteen thousand seven hundred and sixty-six dollars and seventy-five cents. Motion to issue the bond. bond. Issue, issue the bond. Issue the bond. Motion to issue the bond. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anthony, you sign here, bro? Yeah, on the back. Uh, Okay. Um, that's all I have, unless you have anything else, Mr. Cahill. Um, that is it. I move that we conclude these, this evening's public hearings. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you.